Welcome to Better System Trader, the podcast to help systematic traders of all levels improve their trading. We'll give you loads of expert tips and practical advice on system design and validation, money management, trading psychology, and many other topics. Whether you're just starting out or a savvy systematic trader, we're here to help you improve your trading and find more success. This is Better System Trader with your host, Andrew Swanscott. Hello and welcome to the Better System Trader podcast. Glad you could join us today where we're going to be talking about confidence and trading. Confidence is a really powerful thing. When people have it, they can do some pretty amazing things. But on the opposite side, a lack of confidence can be debilitating too. And for traders, it can have some similar effects, especially in the times when a trader is switching from backtesting a strategy to live trading, or even when the performance of a strategy starts to suffer and a trader has money on the line. So what can we do about this? How can we have more confidence in the strategies that we build and trade? Confidence that we've built strategies that are robust. Confidence to continue trading strategies during the periods when the strategy performance may be struggling. Our special guest for this episode is Adrian Reed from Enlightened Stock Trading. And in our chat, Adrian is going to enlighten us on building trading strategies that we can have confidence in. Now, we're not just going to talk about trading psychology here, but Adrian is actually going to be sharing practical aspects of system design and validation that can give us more confidence in the strategies that we create and trade live. So some of the things you'll discover in my chat with Adrian today are the five key areas traders must address to build confidence in a trading system. We're also going to look at significance testing, why it's important to strip a strategy down to just the core components and how to determine which components are actually driving performance. We'll also talk about the transition from backtesting a strategy to live trading, how it can be a difficult and uncertain one and the preparation steps traders need to take to make that transition smooth. We'll also discuss a technique called start date stepping, which can provide valuable insights into how a strategy could perform in live trading. Plus, we cover a whole bunch more, including performance profiling across market conditions, sensitivity testing, why traders lose discipline, testing strategy rules in reverse, plus a lot more. So let's jump over now to my chat with Adrian Reed. Hi, Adrian. Welcome to the show. It's really great to have you here. Hey, Andrew. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Now, we've been in touch, um, I think, occasionally over the last few years, so it's really nice to um, finally have you on the show. But before we get started today, how about you? Um, we get to know you a little bit better? So can you give us a little bit of background on yourself and how you got started in trading? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Um, so I've been trading actively now for probably a bit over 15 years. Um, my first exposure to the stock market, though, was long before that. Actually, my, my earliest memory of stock market type uh, material was when I was nine years old, uh, my family had a game called the stock market game. And um, I, I remember playing that with my dad and my brother. And it really kind of captured my attention. You know, the it, it was on the Australian stock market. And so you moved around the board and bought and sold classic Australian stocks, some of which no longer exist. And um, <laughs> so my early, earliest memory of the stock market is becoming a paper billionaire because um, I played this game for hours and end with my brother. Um, but fast forward a few years and, and I got started mainly um, you know, as I was first um, entering the workforce, I started um, you know, really realizing what I was in for as, a, as an adult in the, in the workforce, going to work every day and all of that. And I, was, I remember sitting on the bus one day, going into the office in the city, just thinking, oh, is this what, is, is this what life's going to be like? And I, I'm, I, really, I, I was already dabbling. Uh, in, in investing and so on. But like I, I made a decision at, at that moment. I made a decision that I wasn't going to do that for the rest of my life. And whatever it took, I was going to learn how to, how to invest or trade or something to, um, to be free so I didn't have to do that for the rest of my life like everyone else that, that I knew. And so pretty much at that point, I started uh, learning about trading. And, and um, you know, I asked, I asked around the people I knew, how do you make money? You know, how do you – like so I don't have to work forever. How do you invest? And, um, you know, my father taught me a little bit about investing. Uh, he was a fundamental investor uh, primarily. And so he taught me a bit about that and I started down that track. But pretty soon I realized I was bored out of my mind and I just, you know, I, I just could not connect with the approach that he was teaching me. 
and I, you know, I tried to read some books and everything, but I, I just, um, it just didn't suit my personality. And so from there, I realized that I needed to find a different way. I needed to find my way. And I started reading and trying different, you know, looking at different books and different approaches. And like many of your listeners, Andrew, I, I came across Market Wizards. And um, as soon as I started market, reading Market Wizards, I, I realized, you know, if, I, if I'm to be successful in the stock market or successful trading in general, uh, I needed to find my way. And so I just started devouring those books. I read all of the books that were published at the time and I wrote notes on every single interview and uh, all the things I liked and didn't like, wanted and didn't want in my life because some of the people in there have absolute crazy lives, you know, forex screens in their bedroom so that they can wake up with one eye and check in the middle of the night. And other people had this amazing life where it was very calm and casual and not stressful at all. And by reading those interviews and writing notes, I figured out what I wanted to do as a trader, who I wanted to be as a trader. And to me, I think that's one of the most important lessons I, I learned, which is, you know, find my way. And everyone who's uh, who's listening, you know, you've got to find your way so that you can succeed because if it doesn't fit you, you can't do it consistently. You know, it's got to fit your lifestyle and the way you want to live. Yeah, that's a really um, great point, actually, and I think we're probably going to touch on that a little bit later. But so just just for a bit more of background, I mean, you've you've been trading a long time now. You even do coaching and things like that. Um, can you can you tell us um, what type of markets you trade? Do you specialize in particular markets, or um, how did you how did you come up with the markets and um, the trading style that you do now? Yeah, absolutely. So um, when I when I first started trading, it was quite discreet. It was always uh, after I gave up on the fundamental um, style of investing, I started looking at charts and technical analysis, and I read a bunch of books on that. And what I realized was there were, you know, there's lots of different ways to trade, and I, I tried a few, you know, a bunch of different methods uh, out. You know, I, I tried different indicators, and I, I tried classical charting analysis. And one day, I, I was I was testing this idea of trend following. And, you know, I didn't really know much about it at the time, but I'd read about a simple system or simple set of rules rather. And I, I took a couple of trades and this one stock just took off and it just did everything it's supposed to do in a classical, you know, in a, a, a long, beautiful trend. And what happened was over the course of watching this stock move over several months, and it was a big trend. It lasted about nine months long, and I made a ton of money, at least relative to my very small account at the time. And as I was watching that, I realized, hey, that's what I want to do. You know, I, that just sitting and watching the trends develop and, and riding them and sitting through those little bits of volatility, that's the way I want to trade. And so what I did was – and this was on a stock – Right, so I I actually like individual stocks. I had some familiarity with it with stocks when I first started out, um, and so that was that was where I where I started and where I've stayed. So as soon as I picked trend following based on that experience, I let go of all of the other strategies I was using, and I started investigating rules around trend following. So um, I I learned how to back test and um, started playing with uh, trend following systems and developed my first couple of trend following systems that uh, didn't work very well because I didn't know about over optimization, curve fitting and risk management and all of those things. But uh, I started to develop rules to guide my trading. And so in, in direct answer to your question, I've always traded stocks. I started on the Australian stock market mainly because I, I lived in Sydney at the time. And as I have grown as a trader, as my account's grown and my, you know, my experience has, has grown, I've branched out into some different markets for diversity uh, to improve my equity curve. And then I've also uh, adjusted that over time to suit my lifestyle. So now, now I actively trade all Australian stocks and Hong Kong stocks. And I actively develop systems for other markets, but from a lifestyle time zone perspective, those work really well for where I am right now. Mm, yeah. And so why uh, do you trade any trend following stocks in the US markets? I know from my own experience, um, trend following is a little bit more difficult there than uh, like in the Australian markets, which have some quite nice trends. Have you looked into the US markets at all? I have absolutely. Actually, I, I've, I've, Develop systems on a lot of markets around the world, and I did trade the U.S. markets for a couple of years for diversification. But what I found was 
uh, the diversification from the Australian market at the time wasn't that great. And also, as you say, trend following US stocks doesn't work or didn't work anywhere near as well as uh, trend following on Australian stocks. Now, I have a few theories about why that is, um, you know, to do with who the market participants are and the, the nature of the indices and the sort of reporting that companies do. But all of that doesn't really matter so much. The fact is, if you design and test a system and it doesn't work well, then there's no, no point trading it. So uh, I settled back on Australia and Hong Kong. They work really well. Plenty of other markets work really well with trend following. Uh, but uh, I, I did drop the US um, from my portfolio after doing it for a, a year or two. Um, the other thing is, as an Australian where I am, from a time zone perspective, it's really quite punishing to to be trading US stocks and Australian stocks. And so to, to maximize my quality of life, which is, you know, let's face it, I, tra- I, I wanted to trade to be free. I didn't want to trade to be sitting in front of the computer or, or suffer from a quality of life perspective. So um, to improve my quality of life, I dropped the US as well. Yeah, sure. Okay, so you've, um, through your coaching, you have um, the opportunity to work with a lot of other traders and students. What do you think are some of the most common missing ingredients to um, successful systematic trading? Yeah, good question. So I, I, I've coached and taught a, a lot of traders now, hundreds of people I've, I've come across from new to experienced. Um, the first and most obvious one really is just the lack of a, a profitable trading system. Now, this could be um, they're just trading an approach that they haven't backtested, and so it doesn't have positive expectancy. Or it could be that they've just backtested it badly, and actually the system is um, is curve fit, over optimized, and doesn't actually have predictive value, even though the the backtest looks good. So they're very common problems. Um, the second problem that a, a lot of traders have, and, and a lot of my students have had before I sort of work through the process with them, is developing that confidence in the system and in the quality of their testing. So, um, you know, you, you can have a system and follow it when times are good. But if you don't have that confidence, that deep-seated, you know, uh, rock-solid confidence that that trading system will pull out of a drawdown, yep. it's very, very hard to sit through a, a drawdown of 10 15 20%. And, you know, a, a lot of traders will give up on a system at precisely the wrong moment because they lack the confidence. And, you know, there's there's nothing more soul-destroying than trading a system and then getting into a drawdown. And let's say you have a 10 15% drawdown and at 15% you you cry uncle and you give up and then you, you stand aside and then two years later you go back and you backtest your system and realize that was the low point. And often it's the low to the day or to the yeah. week, right? Because <laughs> yeah. that's, the, that's the way psychology works in the markets. So confidence in your trading system. Um, once you've got that, if you've got a trading system that you're confident in, you need the discipline to follow it. And you know, I, I've coached a lot of traders on the discipline, particularly around their execution. You know, you must take the signal when you get the signal. And my, you know, my mantra whenever I, I get asked this question, you know, many times a week, you know, should I take this trade or what should I do in this situation? And my my mantra is always the same. It's what would your back test do? Because your job as a trader, once you've got a system that you're confident in, your job is to replicate the back test in the real world. And so every single question about execution comes down to that. How can I get as close as possible to what my back test would do? And then the final thing, which is you know broader than the system, is you've got a plan to take into account disturbances. I mean, you know, kids get sick, uh, you go on holidays, you know, there's power outages, the internet goes down, all of those sorts of things. Uh, a, a lot of new traders will let them, those disruptions throw them for a six. You know, it'll cause them to miss their trading that day or miss their trading that week. And you must plan for those things so that you can follow the rules consistently. Because it's only in following the rules consistently that you get the 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 expectancy, the positive expectancy that the system should be generating. Yeah. Yeah, especially I think with trend following um, strategies, you could be uh, you know you're relying on a couple of big trends to uh, make up for all those losses. So if you miss a couple, that could be it could kill your year basically. So. Um, yeah, it's, it's extremely important uh, to follow the system and take all the trades. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's two. There's two kind of. Mis- I mean, there's many kinds of mistakes, but let's let's just put them into two buckets. There's there's the small regular mistakes, and then there's, there's the larger irregular infrequent mistakes, and even something as slip as simple as slippage can be a real killer. Like, let's say your your system demands that you enter at the opening price tomorrow if you get a signal today, which many systems do. Um, that's a fine assumption for a back test. But if you're, as a novice trader who's got a job, if you're sitting at your desk and your boss, you know, you have meetings with your boss every day when the market opens and you can't actually place the order at the open, you've got a big problem. So you've got to take into account even just the tiny little uh, impacts and differences uh, that can uh, influence the performance that you get from your real-time trading and trying to eliminate those those problems as much as possible. Yeah. Yeah, so you raised a number of good points there. Um which I think are, um, are very good. But there's one there that was in extremely important, and that is confidence. And as you mentioned, you know, if a trader doesn't have confidence in their trading systems, that can cause, cause a whole bunch of issues. So what do you think it takes to build confidence in a trading systems? Yeah, look, good question, Andrew. I think this is huge because um, I see a lot of traders who just lack that confidence. And, I, and, and so I, uh, this is really worth spending some time on. The first one is having a rock solid process to design and test your system. Okay, now, um, you know, I teach a process to, 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 to develop stock systems and you've you know, spoken with various other um, famous traders who also have a process to do that. So, you know, we don't necessarily need to go into a lot of the, the detail for design and optimization of the systems, but you must have a process that you're confident in that will develop a positive expectancy system. The second one is the, the, the parameters within your system have to be stable. You know, you've got you've to know that the parameter values that you choose aren't going to break down. They, are, they aren't going to uh, work today and fail tomorrow. You also need to know that the, st- the system is stable, not just the parameters, but the performance. So um, a lot of systems that you read about in books, if you, if you go and code them and test them today, what you'll see is that the edge has gradually decayed over time. And typically that's because more and more people are trading the system. Um, or it could be that the markets are shifting and changing and the edge of that system uh, is disintegrating. But you must be sure that the system performance is stable. Because if you know that it's not falling apart, then you, then you know also that the drawdown is not system death. It's just drawdown. Uh, the, for, the fourth point is, is significance. Um, I, you know, when I have a system... I need to know that every component of that system is significant and important. If there's extra extra rubbish in there that's not adding value, like rules that um, you know are for polish or to to kind of tweak the performance, but not really making a significant difference, you're gonna you're gonna run into troubles. And so significance and simplicity kind of go hand in hand a little bit, I guess. Um, and then the final thing is robustness. You know, your system must be able to cope with changes and shocks so that it doesn't blow you up when something changes. Hmm. So you mentioned there that it's important to um, have a stable trading system or have stability in a trading system. So how do you actually yep. do that? How do you get the confidence that a system is um, it's actually stable? Yeah, okay, good. So there's, well, let's break it into the two parts of the two components of stability. There's parameter stability and performance stability. We'll talk about parameters first. Um, so let's say your system has four or five parameters in the system. And obviously, the, the fewer parameters, the better, because we want to keep it simple so that it, it, um, it can be robust. So if you have four or five parameters in your system, you want to, you know, you want to uh, choose those parameters so that Yes, the value gives you positive profitability, but the profitability isn't very sensitive to the value of the parameter you choose. So let's take a dumb example. Let's say you have a moving average crossover system. Now, I don't recommend you trade a moving average crossover system necessarily, but let's just use it as an example. Let's say you you, you buy when the 50-day moving average crosses above the 200-day moving average, and you sell when it crosses back below. Just, a, again, a simple dumb example. Um the, for parameter stability, you would take that 50-day moving average and that 200-day moving average and vary it over a fairly wide range. I mean, plus or minus 20, 30 percent, 
and validate that no matter where you put that set that parameter value, the system is profitable. And not only profitable, but tradable. Because if it's, if the 50 200 day combination works, but the 45 195 combination falls apart, you've got a huge problem. But if if the system works with with sh- with parameter values for the short term moving average anywhere between thirty and seventy, and for the long term moving average anywhere between a hundred and three hundred, you know that system performance is pretty stable. The parameter performance is stable. So when we vary the parameters, it shouldn't matter that much. That's that's my point. Because you know, ev- everyone who's done optimization for more than about five minutes realizes that you can optimize something for the past, but then when you start trading it in real time, the future is different than the past, and so the the future optimum parameter is different than the past optimum parameter. So by choosing, by designing a system with stable parameters, that problem matters less. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we um, we talk a lot about optimization on this podcast. It can be a very yep. uh, challenging aspect of trading, and it's uh, it's kind of like a balancing act. There's a bit of art and a bit of science involved to it. Uh, so, what's your take on how and why to optimize? Then, um, look, there's two purposes uh, commonly discussed for optimization. The most common one, which I think is actually the least important, is to improve performance. The um, the second one is to check for stable performance so you know there's there's a whole lot of things we need to be careful of when we're optimizing particularly curve fitting to past data um, cherry picking to particular trades or market conditions uh, are just two you know very significant challenges we face so the real purpose of optimization in my mind is yeah make sure the system is as profitable as possible but even more important make sure that it's as stable as possible you know, I, I like to look through the um, the parameter sets that I'm I'm choosing from and find the areas of stability and and use those. And I want to make sure that those areas of stability uh, hold over a long period of time. I'm I'm a I'm a fairly long term trader, so I'll typically hold my my positions for several months or, or longer. And you know, you can make very good returns as a trend follower doing that, um, particularly when you when you choose the right markets. Um, so because my positions are fairly long term, I don't want to be re-optimizing my system uh, all the time. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I want my parameters to hold true through bull market, through bear market over time. You know, and I've I've had systems, I've traded systems where I, I literally haven't changed a parameter for a decade, and the system continued to work amazingly well. And that's that's what I'm after, you know, stable performance. And you only get that by optimizing looking for stability rather than looking for maximum performance because maximum performance is almost always cherry-picking a data, an, an anomaly in the data, as you, you're well aware. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Now, I think um, something that you mentioned a little bit earlier was uh, significance testing. I think it was in the context of uh, individual components of your system. Can you share a little bit more about um, what you mean there? Yeah, absolutely. So myself, um, early on, and almost all of the tra- new traders that I've coached have had this, this, this challenge where you develop a system and the performance looks good, but what if I could make it better? You know, what if I could add, what about this rule or what about that rule or what about that rule? And, and the, you get this, uh, this problem where you had a really great system, but you've layered on rule after rule in an effort to try and filter out the garbage and maximize the good trades. Now, of course, with a little bit of experience, we know that, you know, that's, that's counterproductive. But exactly which things are adding the edge? You know, if you've found yourself in a situation where you've got, you've added a few rules and filters to your system, you've really got to take a step back and have a look at it and go, well, all right, what in my system is really generating the edge? What can I strip out to simplify it so everything is significant? And the reason I want everything to be significant is because if it's not significant, it's going to cause you problems in the future. Because it's a rule that's sitting there doing nothing, that could have an un- unintended consequence that you haven't yet realized uh, in your future trading. So I want to get rid of it because I want to only trade the things that are making a difference in my backtest. Okay? So how do we do that? Well, um, I take 
you know, let's say I've got a completed system. What I'll do typically is take each rule one at a time and remove it from the system and compare system performance before and after on a whole range of metrics. You know, I'll look at the number of trades generated with and without that rule. I'll look at the, the profitability with and out without that rule, the, uh, the reliability, the percentage winners of the trade uh, of the system with and without the rule, and also the equity curve and compare. And then what I'll do is I'll also reverse the rule. Like let's say it's a, it's a inequality, so this has to be greater than that. I'll also check if this is less than that, so the opposite of the original rule, and make sure that I'm actually drawing a distinction between good trades and bad trades. You know, I want it to be a very black and white, blunt distinction that yes, this rule makes a difference. That's what it has to be, because. If it's not black and white, blunt, yes, it absolutely makes a difference. It makes the system better. It doesn't belong. Hmm. So I'll do that with each rule one at a time and remove the ones that are obviously not making a difference. And then I'll go through and do that process again with the remaining rules until I get down to the core rules, which are really driving performance. And they're the stable, significant rules that, that I know I can be confident in. And that's back to that original theme of confidence. Yeah, I think one of the other, um, actually, I think it was the last point you mentioned there um, when we were talking about what it takes to build confidence in a trading system is robustness, um, which is another thing we talk about a lot on the podcast. So how do you personally determine if a system is robust? Yeah, absolutely. Good question. Um, it's it's closely related to you know significance and sensitivity, but let's say – Let's say we've got a system and we've narrowed it down to the small number of rules that really make a difference and we've optimized it and we've chosen our parameter set. So robustness is what? Well, it's about that system performing and not breaking under a whole range of conditions. And so there's a couple of ways you can test that. I mean, the first thing I'll, I'll do is I'll test my system on multiple markets. So let's say it's a system for the Australian stock market. I'll have um, you know data that is unseen to my system, out of sample data if you like, which I'll test the system on um, from the Australian stock market. Now that's nice, but that's still very similar to the other data that I've designed the system on in the Australian stock market. So it gives me an added level of confidence, but it's not absolute. The next thing I'll do is I'll go to other markets which I know are similar. So you know, I've done enough enough design work. I've looked at enough charts to know that you know a few other markets trade somewhat similarly to my market. So I'll test it on those, and if the system survives and works and is tradable, then that's another tick. So it gives me added confidence. So that's the first step is out of sample in your existing market. Say um, the second step might be a completely different market, and then the third that that, that still trades similarly to your own market, and then the third step might be another very unrelated market. And as long as all of those are acceptable, then I'm thinking, okay, good, the system is, is pretty, pretty robust. The next step is to understand the robustness of the parameters. Okay, so we already did stability. Okay, but, but typically when you do something about stability of the parameters, it's one parameter at a time. I mean, you can, you can do a brute force optimization, optimize five parameters at once, but it's very hard to visualize that. Yeah. So I tend to do it in a much more simplified way, one or two parameters at a time, so I can visualize the, the parameter space. But for robustness testing, what I like to do is vary every single parameter simultaneously. And by what I'm, what I'm trying to do is check that no matter how I shake up the system, that it's still profitable. So if I take every single parameter in my system and vary it, say, plus or minus 20% or plus or minus 30% and then run an optimization that will test every single combination of those plus or minus values for each parameter, you know, I might get a few thousand parameter set combinations for this system. I want almost every single one of those to be profitable and preferably tradable. Because if, if I've shaken the parameter values that much and it's still tradable, then I'm feeling pretty good about the robustness of that system. Hmm. So you've said a couple of times now this um, plus or minus 20 to 30% range. Is that 
Um, how did you come up with that range? Is that something you've just discovered over time or is it recommended from someone else or where does that um, range actually come from? Look, I, I guess it's it comes from the best systems that I've used over time knowing how stable they are. Um, you know, I've, I've tested many, many systems, I mean hundreds of systems over, over the years and I've thrown away most of them because they're just not robust enough. And what I have done over my years of system development and testing is gradually replace what I'm doing with more and more robust models. And so I know that the systems I'm trading can cope with that level of uh, variation in the parameters and still survive. Mm. Now, it's not so much about the parameters. What it is really in real-time trading, it's about if the market shifts or if market behavior changes – Will my system survive? And you can simulate that by testing on different markets and different market conditions, but you can also simulate it by varying the parameters and seeing, hey, does this still keep me alive? And so I, I know that my current systems can cope with that, so I wouldn't uh, be as confident in a, a different system that wasn't able to cope with that level of variation. So then I guess after traders have done all this, they've done the um, you know the stability checks and the significance testing, sensitivity, all these robustness um, checks, what else could there be that um, could potentially um, stop a trader from succeeding? Discipline. <laughs> that was a pretty quick answer. <laughs> well, look, I mean, again, with, 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 my, with my students and with people I've coached um, just through my interactions, lack of discipline – to follow the trading system is um, is one of the biggest failings because plenty of traders have a good system or at least a reasonable system, but they're losing money hand over fist, not because the, because of the system, but because they're not following the system properly. Mm-hmm. And look, I, I think that comes from from two main sources from what I've observed. The first one is that your system doesn't suit you, and the second one is that you don't understand how the system actually performs day to day. Let me uh, let me tackle those two things one at a time. Sure. Yeah. The system really has to suit you because if it doesn't fit in with your lifestyle, you're not going to be able to follow the signals because you can't take them as and when they come. If it doesn't fit in with your objectives, then your emotions are going to kick in at precisely the wrong time. Like let's say your objective subconsciously that you haven't really uh, recognized or written down is that you don't want to lose more than 10% of your capital. That's fine. But if your, if, if your system has a maximum possible drawdown of 20%, you're going to be in trouble at some point, guaranteed. And so both return and risk objectives uh, need to be matched to the trader and to the, to, between the trader and the system. So, um, you know, oftentimes I'll, I'll, I'll come across someone who's, who's lost a lot of money and given up trading or at least started cherry picking the signals from their system. And almost always it's because something's happened in the performance that they, they, they weren't comfortable with, didn't suit their objectives. So um, we talked about lifestyle. We talked about objectives. The last component is personality. So some people will – be very comfortable trading a system that's right 60% of the time as long as the the you know the wins and losses the win loss ratio is sufficient to give them profitability but typically a high win rate system will have smaller winners and slightly bigger losers other people will be more confident or, and and happy trading a system that has 40% winners but much bigger winners and smaller losses now, I know from my own personal experience that when I get this wrong, it's much harder to follow the signals because if you get a loss which is bigger than you're deep down comfortable with, it's hard to take the next trade. Or if you have more losing trades in a row than you're deep down comfortable with, it's hard to take the next trade. So it's got to suit your lifestyle, it's got to suit your objectives, and it's got to suit your personality. If you don't have those things, it's very hard to have the discipline to follow the system. Yeah. Make sense? Yeah, that's a really good point. I think especially um, personality. Um, when I, earlier in my trading uh, career, I was trading a, 
uh, like a weekly rotational strategy. And um, me personally, I like to be busy and um, I'm quite impatient. Although, you know, after a couple of kids, I've kind of mellowed out a little bit. But, you know, <laughs> early, in my younger days, um, you know, that strategy was actually a profitable strategy, but I, I couldn't trade it because it didn't really work for my personality and actually it annoyed me. So right. uh, I think I think it really is. Um, um, I mean, it, it helped guide me into the type of trading that I do now. So it was beneficial. But yeah, I think it really does matter a lot um, to find a strategy that meets, uh, you know, matches your personality and your objectives and lifestyle. Right. And just to make just to, to make sure that everyone feels normal and okay about this, I've learned this through through hideously bad experience. I mean, I I, I went through a period where I was trading a, a system which was wrong on personality. It was wrong on objectives and it was wrong on lifestyle. And it was disastrous. You know, I, I spent three months uh, – so I'm a long-term trader now. I spent three months day trading. But I had a full-time job. And I don't like making decisions under pressure quickly. And I don't like being busy. I, I, I like to make slow and more considered decisions. And lifestyle-wise, you know, I don't want to be sitting staring at the computer and have that stress. And so I was trying to trade this system because I thought, well, everyone else is day trading. Maybe I'll try day trading, see what all the fuss is about. And I tried it and I lost about $30,000 trading that system before I even realized what was going on. And it was because it was wrong for me on all three levels, personality, objectives, and lifestyle. Yeah. So we talked about, I mean, you, you, the, the original question was discipline and, and what causes the lack of discipline. The two things were the system's got to suit you and then not understanding how the system trades day to day. So personality objectives and lifestyle is about does the system suit you? But what's interesting is, you know, as system traders, what are we doing? We're, we're, we're backtesting and designing systems over past data. But I don't know about you, when I'm looking at my backtest, that could be 10, 20, 30 years of history, right? Hmm. Depending on what style of system or what markets you're developing. But when you're trading – when you're actually executing the system, what time frame do you care about? Right now, today. And what, what is the system doing now compared to yesterday? And so what's interesting is in the design process, we have this massive like macro view over decades of system performance. But when we're trading at real time, you've got to zoom right in and look at a couple of days, a couple of bars. And your attention is on very different things than it than during the backtesting process. And so if you go from backtest straight into designing a system without really investigating how the system behaves day to day, you're going to wind up in trouble because you've got to understand what's natural, what's normal for that system day to day so that you don't freak out at the wrong moment. Yeah. So then what can traders do then to kind of uh, get that expectation correct for when they do um, move from, you know, back testing to live trading? Yeah, this, the, the, I think it's this is really a really powerful point. There's a couple of things that I do in my design process. Once I've finished the back test and finalized the rules, there's then a period of investigation to find out what's normal. What's normal for that day-to-day -day behavior. Um, there's And there's... Uh, the biggest challenge I think that most traders face when they're, when they're starting with a new system is that initial period. You know, I'm going to put capital into market and start trading this new system. The first trade, the first couple of bars, the first couple of weeks, the performance during that phase really plays with your emotions because – it's when you feel like you've got the most at risk. If you put a hundred grand into an account and you start trading a system, you're going to feel pretty bad if you lose ten thousand, typically. But if you've if you've put a hundred thousand dollars into an account and five years later your account's worth half a million bucks, losing ten thousand dollars in a drawdown is no big deal, right? So what I like to do is try and investigate as much as possible what could happen when I start trading. And so the first thing I like to do is um, is run a back test where I step the start date. You know where you know typically we might do the back test starting on you know a certain point in time and design it for a certain number of years and then walk it forward. 
Um, and, and, you know, however you're going to optimize, whether you do cl- simple classical optimization or walk forward optimization. Um, but I like to run the test with my final rules starting it on, let's say, 1st of January 1990. And then I might step it forward to the 1st of February 1990 and run it again. And then March and then April and so on all the way through the entire data set. And what, what I'm doing is I'm looking for what does that initial drawdown look like? How long does it take for me to be profitable on average? You know, how, um, how many trades might it take to be profitable? What's my confidence that after one week, one month, three months, six months, I'm up or, or up more than, you know, five or 10%, a certain amount that's meaningful to me? Because by looking at that entire, start, that entire data set and starting the simulation on many different days, you can get a good idea of what's normal for when you start trading today. Like, like yes, the future could be different than the past, but if you've tested every possible start date in the past, you've got a very good idea of what could happen, the range of things that could happen today if you start. So start date stepping, I think, is really powerful. Yeah, that's a um, – just thinking about that, that's a really um, interesting idea because – uh, I guess if you've got, say, for example, a trend following um, long system and you start testing it right at the beginning of a bull market, you're probably going to look like a genius. But you step it back a year or two when it uh, takes into account the bear market, you could get very different uh, back test results, so, um, to, which could you know, mislead you and give you the wrong expectation if you don't do that. Absolutely. Because if you're expecting, I mean, if you're expecting to make Let's say you're expecting to make an average of 20% per year, but you start trading right at the peak of a bull market. There's no way your first couple of years are going to be that profitable if you're trading long side trend following. So we must understand what's possible so that we can make a decision about are we comfortable with that. And then you know, when we're trading for three months or six months and we stop to evaluate our performance and evaluate our system – we can look at it and go, okay, was what I've just experienced within the bounds of normal for this system? If yes, continue trading. If no, there's a problem, something's broken, we need to go and revise, revisit. And so whatever you can do as a trader to investigate the bounds of what's normal for that system. So we talked about start date. You know, The other thing to understand is performance profile. You know, and you, Andrew, you pointed out if you started trading at the at the bottom of a, at the at the start of a bull market, you're going to look like an absolute champion if you're alongside trend following. Of course, that's true. What you're also going to see is you're going to have a very high percentage of winners. Your durations, your, your duration of winners is going to be pretty long. Your duration of losses is going to be pretty short, and your initial drawdown is going to be close to zero. And you have a very high confidence that after a couple of weeks or a couple of months, you're going to be quite profitable. But that's, that, that's the situation at the start of a bull market. You want to understand what the, the percentage of winners and lo- losers your system generates across all market conditions are, not just on average. Like the temptation, again, for backtesting, we're looking at many years of history. And the temptation is to look at the average and say, yeah, I'm good with that. Hmm. But if you look at the percentage of winners – during a bull market and the percentage of winners during a consolidating market and the percentage of winners during a bear market, they're going to be very different for almost every system. And so to trade with confidence back to that original theme, you better understand what you could get, what, what's normal. Hmm. Yeah. So, you know, I like to look at the percentage of winners over time, the size of the win over time, the expectancy over time, the size of the losses over time and the duration of trades over time as you move through the entire test period. Because once I understand how they vary through bull markets, bear markets, sideways markets, I get those bounds of normality in my mind and in my notes so that when I'm evaluating my real-time performance, I can say, hey, is this normal or not? If it is, no problem. I can keep trading with confidence. If it's not normal, something's broken. I have to go and check or suspend, or suspend trading. Yeah, I think earlier um, in our chat, you mentioned that you like to keep your um, parameter values pretty stable across a long period of time. So does that mean you you um, you test uh, bulls and bears markets and high volatility, low volatility, all different kinds of market environments as one to see how it impacts the strategy? Yeah, bear, bearing in mind, I'm 
uh, my personal trading is quite long term and it's uh, most of it is trend following. I do have some swing, swing trading systems as well. But for the long term stuff, I like to make sure that my test period includes all market types. Hmm. So because I want, I want the systems to survive um, th- no matter what the market is doing. And if that means going to cash, that's fine for that system. Then, you know, I've got a short system which will, you know, pick up the slack and make some money. But um, I want to make sure that no matter what's happening in the market, the system is stable and robust enough to not exceed my maximum loss parameter. So, yeah, I look at, I look at um, my test window quite long term um, for the long term systems. I won't change the parameters drastically uh, over time. It'll be a slow adjustment. And I want those parameters to su- to survive and help me thrive, no matter what the market's doing. Yeah. Okay. All right. Cool. I just want to uh, start wrapping up in a minute, but I think I might have cut you off in that last part there. So, was there anything else that you wanted to add to the, um, I guess, switching to live trading and kind of managing our expectations there? Yeah. Look, I, I just think people underestimate the the change in focus and mindset from backtest to day-to-day trading and it really warrants um, working through the the range, the performance parameters of the system and looking at the daily and weekly and monthly ranges of those so that you understand what's normal and then also um, going through the process of running the system. Um, I'm not a big believer of paper trading at least not for the I not for the purposes of testing a system but I am a believer of doing it for a while to come to grips with the process. You know, the process of executing it and checking for execution mistakes and checking that there's nothing in your lifestyle or your daily routine that's conflicting with run, the running of the good operation of this system. So I'll, I'll encourage my students to do that for just a little while to make sure that they've got the process down uh, smoothly and they've ironed out any kinks and they've observed some of the trades coming up and they've observed the execution of those orders, at least in a simulated sense, um, so they've got that comfort. So that's, prob- that's probably the last thing. Um, apart from the, you know, we don't, there's probably never enough emphasis given to, to trading plans and the components of trading outside the system. I mean, I think um, most of us are guilty of, um, you know, following the system but not, not planning our trading fully as a business at some point. Um, so, you know, I would just encourage people to think beyond the system as well to what are the things that could go wrong and how could you plan for them? Yep. All right. Yeah, that's a great point too. Thanks, Adrian. So I just want to um, start wrapping up now with some quick closing questions. Sure. Okay. So the first one, what's the biggest lesson that you've learned through trading? Oh, the biggest, the biggest lesson is absolutely that the system must fit me. And I think this is true for everyone. But what's what's amazing is that what fits me could be so drastically different than what fits someone else. You know, I've been to I've been to now countless seminars and courses where people are teaching a system or teaching an approach to trading. And teaching an approach is one thing, but if that if you're not exactly the same as the instructor and your personality, objectives, and lifestyle, it's going to be very hard for you to follow that system. But it, but that's so that's why what I teach is the process to come up with the strategy and the system. Because by learning the process, you can develop something which works for you, and you know that then matches back to my biggest lesson in trading, which is it's got to match your personality, objectives, and lifestyle. Yeah, good point. Okay, how about the best trading advice you've ever received? Best trading advice I've ever received. Follow the system. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's it's it sounds dumb and simple, but any supplementation of the trading rules with my own cleverness is a war- is a is a warning sign. I I have this little trigger in my mind where any time I'm tempted to override or adjust, I have this little siren that kind of I make go off in my head. It's like, warning, warning, warning. Right? Because, yeah. because, you know, we're human. And fundamentally, most humans are not good traders. But my system, my system is a good trader. So if I can just follow my system to the letter, I'll make a ton of money. 
So, so follow the system. Yeah. Okay. How about um, you mentioned the Market Wizards before, but what about any other uh, favorite trading books that you like to uh, you read? Oh, absolutely. I, I've read a lot, and I've read a lot of um, a lot of junk and a small number of amazing gems that have had a huge impact on my journey. So the ones that have had a huge impact, obviously the Market Wizards books, um, I've got huge value out of those. Uh, Bob Pardo's book, The Evaluation Optimization of Trading Strategies, is an amazing book which all systematic traders should read, no question. Um, Thomas uh, Stridesman's books, uh, also very helpful. And um, early on when I read uh, Van Tharp's uh, Trade Your Way to Financial Freedom, that had a very significant impact on my, on my journey. Um, one other lesser known one, which I don't hear a lot of people talk about, is uh, Richard Weisman, um, Mechanical Trading Systems. It was his first book, I think. Um, and at the time, it just had a huge impact on me because he went through in that book uh, long term trend trading systems, swing trading systems, and mean reversion systems, and talked a lot about the personality of the trader and who you have to be to really be comfortable taking each of those different approaches. Mm. Um, and and backed it up with with you know with data and with back testing and and so on. So I really love that book as well. Yep, cool. Okay, so if someone wanted to um, uh, get in touch with you or to learn more from you, what's the best way that they could do that? Oh yeah, good. So um, so my uh, my my business is Enlightened Stock Trading. So my website is um, enlightenedstocktrading.com. But um, for the um, better system traders, readers who are interested, or listeners rather, who are interested to to learn a little more about all of this, I put together a little bundle of um, of uh, bonuses, goodies, if you like, which um, which they can get if um, if so. If you go to go dot enlightenedstocktrading.com forward slash Better System Trader and Andrew, I think we'll have a link or something somewhere. Yeah, I'll get a link for that. <laughs> um, yeah. What what I'll um, what I, what I'm including for um, for your listeners, just so they can you know, take these concepts and and push them a little further and learn a little more deeply, is some cheat sheets around the concepts we've talked about. So talking about stability, significance, robustness, and um, system design. Um, I'll also include some additional training videos. I'll just record, record I've recorded an, a number of videos on each of those concepts just to elaborate, so you can revisit those concepts. Um, and then I've also got a um, a trading uh, evaluation uh, survey. So it's like a a quiz where you answer some questions and allows me to share what um, what improvements you can make to improve your trading or stabilize your trading. And so that that will be in there too. So if you are interested in learning more, that's what I'd suggest you do first because you get a whole bunch of additional value and then um, obviously we'll be in touch after that and um, and I can answer any questions that, um, that the listeners have. Sure. All right. Well, thanks a lot for putting that uh, package together, Adrian. I wasn't expecting you to do <laughs> that. So <laughs> thank you very much for, sh for sharing. Now, um, is there anything else that you'd like to mention before we finish up for today? Yeah, look, I, I think something that comes up for me over and over again and is new traders thinking about their journey, okay? And there's this concept that uh, I haven't seen really talked about about what traders have to do in different p stages of their lifestyle, if you're new and you've just started system trading, what is your job? Your job is to follow the system, get good trading habits, and start to build your account. It's not to make a ton of money overnight because this is not a get-rich-quick scheme. You know, it's, it's just do the things which will build your account. When you've got a bit more money in your account, the temptation is to use that money for lifestyle. Like, you know, let's say you've built a couple of hundred thousand dollars and you want to go buy a new car. Don't do that because that, that sets you back. You know, you, what you want to do is get to the point of no return. And I think this is the reason why most traders don't become self-sufficient because they don't let themselves get to the point of no return. I want to see more traders build their account through to seven figures so that they're past that point of no return and their trading will always support them. So in the middle, when your account is really starting to grow and rocket, what's your job? It's to keep following the system and to pump money in so that you get past the point of no return. Harvest comes later when you're you know, you've already got a high six, seven figure account and you can really support yourself. So be, be patient. That's what I'm asking. Yeah, I think that's uh, something that a lot of traders underestimate is actually how much capital you really need to make a living. And I mean, if you look on the internet, there's all these kind of 
you know, promises of making a, a um, you know truckload of money from a small account. It just doesn't happen like that in reality. So I think you raise a good point there about having to build up the account to a, a larger sum before you can actually uh, make a living from trading. Absolutely. I mean, and those things are just marketing stunts. You know, they're just they're they're just marketing written by um, you know fraudsters who are trying to get you know a quick buck. But in reality, trading's a long term game and you know, when you commit yourself to that long term game, it's hugely rewarding if you'll just be patient and follow the process. Yeah. Absolutely. That's a great uh, point to finish up on. So thank you very much for your time today, Adrian. It was really great having a chat to you and uh, appreciate all that you have shared today. So thanks again and uh, I wish you all the best. Thanks, Andrew. Pleasure to be here. Really enjoyed it. All right. Cheers. Bye. Thank you. Bye now. Okay, well, that's it for this episode. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show. Come on over to bettersystemtrader.com. That's where you'll find all the previous episodes, all the transcribes, all the show notes, and all the free weekly trading tips. bettersystemtrader.com. Bettersystemtrader.com.